Welcome to the Deep Bass Podcast, where we take a hard look at the element that makes or breaks games, the music. I'm Peter Thomas, and I'm joined by my co-host, Cody Haltom, and we're happy to have you along with us on our journey through GoldenEye 007. What's going on, Cody? It's late. <laughs> <laughs> it this is, is late. the this is latest late. we've ever recorded an episode, and I am tired. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, our schedules couldn't make it happen until now and it got a little wonky. So, yeah, this is uh, this is a late one for sure. Aside from tired, everything else is good. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing great, man. How are you? I am good. It's been a busy weekend. I celebrated my son's first birthday. And even for that being a birthday that we didn't we didn't have anybody over or anything like that he doesn't have any friends or anything you know it was just cake and ice cream and then we video chatted with um, some family who wanted to wish him a happy birthday that kind of thing i still felt like i went and i ran a marathon because when it was done i was dead exhausted <laughs> <laughs> oh being social it sucks i know <laughs> i know so i think it is i think it was just i i lifed too much that day and I ended up exhausting myself yeah, and it's it hard for a good reason because I mean, I saw the pictures. He had a blast and that's what matters. He did. He did. I've got many cake face pictures and ice cream smeared all over his high chair and things like that. So I, yeah, I can't complain. It was a, uh, I, I spent most of the day crying anyways. So, I mean, that was also part of the draining piece. Um, oh yeah. It's hard, hard to believe that he's already won. I feel like it was just, Yesterday, I was like, oh, I, I got a son. <laughs> yeah, it, it really was kind of like that. It was a weird point in time because all of a sudden I got a picture and there's a kid and I was just like, oh, well, finally that happened. And then there goes my friend. <laughs> Fatherhood <laughs> has taken him away. R.I.P. Yeah. Yeah. Things got real busy. Anywho, we are here to discuss Goldeneye, which I'm excited about. I think I told you it was either the last yeah it was the last episode we were talking about it and i said uh, there was a method to my madness so episode seven it just came to me and i'm like you know what episode seven has to be reserved for golden eye the numbers zero zero seven i don't think i can think of anything else but golden eye and maybe punch out when i see them so it seemed fitting Oh, yeah, definitely. Now, you and I, like, we've talked games to death, like not just on deep bass, but, you know, in our personal lives. So I know kind of like your taste and that kind of stuff. Where did you or where do you come down on the 007 film franchise? Is that something that you're into? I wasn't for the longest time. And I definitely will talk a lot more about it in in my history. But I wasn't for a while. And I believe it was this game that kind of jump started me into going back and watching all the films, but I have watched most, if not all of them at this point, except for maybe a couple of the new ones, you know, my taste, I'm not a shooter guy by any stretch of the imagination. So to know that I'm talking about this and have quite a history with it, it's different for sure. Yeah. And that's why uh, when we were talking last episode, you know, about this one, and I said kind of under my breath, but I meant it. I was like, well, I think it's weird, you know, because it is a weird pull for to be a game that both of us have actually played and had a connection with. But honestly, looking back at it, the time frame, the ages that we were, it's not surprising at all. Right. Yeah, definitely not. Speaking of time frame, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump into the history here. So. GoldenEye 007 is a 1997 first-person shooter developed by Rare, our, our beloved Rare, and published by Nintendo for the N64. Based on the 1995 James Bond film GoldenEye, it features a single-player campaign in which the player assumes the role of British Secret Intelligence Service agent James Bond as he fights to prevent the criminal syndicate from using a satellite weapon against London to cause a global financial meltdown. This game included a split screen multiplayer mode, which is pretty much, I think, what it's really known for, in which up to four players can compete in different types of deathmatch games. It receives critical acclaim with more than 8 million copies being sold, making it the third best selling Nintendo 64 game of all time. I know that sounds strange because the N64 was kind of it was in a weird spot. You know, most consoles at this point in time were moving to disc based 
mediums and Nintendo was like, yeah, we're not, we're not quite there yet. We're still going to produce cartridges. So carts back then were still much more expensive than, than CD based games. So they typically were a lot more pricey on the shelves, but to see that this was the third best selling game was kind of incredible. I did look up the list of games to see what numbers one and two were just out of morbid curiosity. The first one was a pack in with Super Mario 64. So that makes sense that it was it was on top of the list. And then the second one was also a pack in a little later in the in the life of the N64. And it was Mario Kart 64. So uh, I believe Goldeneye was a pack in for a little bit, but I don't think it was quite as as heavily pushed out as, say, Mario 64 was. No, I would think that that would be kind of like one of those Toys R Us exclusive type thing where it was vendor specific, if it was at all. Right, right. And it probably had a console that came with like a fancy controller color or something like that, because they were big on having the entire console be a a different color. Uh, I remember the Donkey Kong 64 was like a see through jungle green and they had, you know, all these funky colors with it, but GoldenEye's music was composed by, and I don't know how to pronounce this person's first name, Graham, Graham, maybe Norgate and Grant Kirkhope primarily with one elevator track produced by Robin Beanland, which I thought was really funny. I went to look at the music credits and sure enough, Robin only produced the elevator track. There's, I think what somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 some songs on this this ost and yep just the elevator song is is robin so that was interesting yeah for sure so let's talk a little bit about our histories behind goldeneye so tell me a little bit about uh, when you were introduced were you always a shooter guy and was this like a, a must buy for you or you know, was it kind of like an off the cuff purchase or friends had it or something like that? Tell me, tell me a little bit about it. Ah, uh, I was not always a shooter guy. This is back okay. when I sucked at shooters. I didn't enjoy shooters at all. I liked doom. That was fun. Wolfenstein as well on PC, whenever I would go to a friend's house and they would just kind of have it, we would play it because it was a quote unquote more mature game. It was something that we shouldn't be playing kind of deal. My first memories of this actually take place in Ohio. I was up at my aunt and uncle's house for Thanksgiving with my family. And anytime I went on vacation, my whatever console I was playing at the time always came with me. It didn't matter where it was or what it was. I mean, my GameCube has some miles, dude. Like, because I have the GameCube that had the um, screen attached to it. So oh, I could plug it into like the cigarette lighter of my parents' van. And like, I would just, we'd go to Texas and I would just play Animal Crossing the entire way. So I had my. Nintendo 64 up in Ohio. And I remember going to, I think it was Blockbuster, probably was, with one of my cousins. And he was older than me. And he offered to rent me Goldeneye. And I was like, oh, cool. Awesome. You know, thanks, bud. Um, And so got home and, you know, was playing it for the duration of this week. That was really all I played. I don't remember a lot. I remember getting my dad to play a couple of matches with me, but he was, you know, and he would, he would play, you know, 30 minutes or so with me. But then obviously he wanted to see his sister and family and his mom and that kind of thing. Meanwhile, I'm the nerd who was just sitting in the, this offshoot room on a tiny TV playing this thing. I didn't even play really multiplayer that much that it was just mainly the campaign. And then this is a game I never owned actually as a kid this was a game i later obtained somehow and as an adult let me tell you it does not hold up well at all (laughs) but i do remember you know back in the day going to a friend's house to spend the night this is what you played this is what you argued over the golden gun mode all these different things this was really the foundation for multiplayer as we know it today 
I didn't realize how much you and I were, were kindred spirits because I was uh, very much the same way. Like anytime I went to a family function or anything like that, I brought my consoles with me. My family always hated it because typically I would have to change the input. I don't know if you remember back then, but anytime you change settings on a television, it was near impossible to find the right one to get back to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was in the same boat. I, I would do that a lot. But for for me, it was a little bit different as far as how I played this game. So my parents were incredibly strict with me growing up. I wasn't allowed to play anything that was rated higher than what I was in my age. So when my parents found out that I was playing this game, they were none too thrilled. Most of my gameplay time had to be when I was staying over a friend's house or something. I would go to their place. We'd have a bunch of us all together. And, you know, we played multiplayer quite a bit. So in that regard, the opposite of you, I I don't think I ever touched the campaign as a kid. Uh, It was always just multiplayer sessions all the time. Whenever I played it, I actually liked it so much, which was strange because like I said, I'm, I'm not a shooter guy. I've never really been a shooter guy and probably never will be. But I just something about this particular game just stuck out to me. I just enjoyed it so much. So I asked one of my friends to borrow it and I I took it home and my parents found out and they're like, you you can't do this. There's you're not allowed to play this game. Nothing. And then I showed them and I was like, well, there's a way I can play with no guns. And that was the slappers only mode, which is literally just judo chopping people to death. And they're like okay, fine. You can play it that way. So there was quite a bit of me having to play it, not in the way that it was intended, which was interesting to say the least, but not nearly as fun, obviously, than, than the pew pew shoot But we had, um, you know, you talked about some arguments and things like that, that we've, we fought over. But one of the things was, is if you may remember this, but the characters that you could pick in multiplayer odd job was shorter than the rest of the characters. And then jaws was the tallest. So everybody's models were roughly the same when you're playing, except for these two characters. And we all would try and fight to see who got to be odd job because you were at a distinct advantage. If you ever picked odd job, I hated you like yeah. immediately because you are like that dick. I mean, I wasn't good at the game. I was terrible. You know, the only yeah. reason why I enjoyed this game was because of proximity mods. That was it. That was the only way I was really able to kill people or have any kind of success because I would be able to trap myself in areas and go back and throw more mines, throw more mines whenever I would get a kill randomly in the game. But Odd Job is just this little asshat. He is literally half the size <laughs> of any of the other characters, and I would say probably triple, you know, Jaws maybe. But yeah, if you pick Odd Job, you are absolutely a dick because you would have to aim down at him. You know, meanwhile, he just run at your shin and chop you, and you're dead, and that would be it. It was so frustrating. The demographics of the people who listen to this show are right around our age. So, so for those who are listening, most of them know kind of what we're talking about. But for the younger crowd that happens to be listening to this podcast, I will tell you that back in the day, back in our old geezer times, we didn't have a second joystick. So oh, yeah. to look up or down was a absolute nightmare. You typically had to use the the directional pad, which on the N64 controller was in the opposite side of where you were holding the controller. It was just a mess or, or maybe it was the C buttons. It was the C buttons. I was about to correct you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. So it was the C buttons, but either way, not nearly as precise, not nearly as easy to get yourself into a position to be able to shoot somebody who was shorter than you. And then When you did adjust your view, getting it back to correcting, you either could walk for a little bit and it would slowly pull itself back up or you could try and adjust it yourself, but you never were at that center point anymore. It was bad. 
No, and I mean, Mario 64 worked as well as it did because of the camera. And it's still clunky, but it worked really well. The C buttons in that game, you would just hit and it would just like spin 90 degrees, spin 90 degrees or however many it was. So you got a different view of what you're doing. You can't do that in first person. So it was like a hold and we didn't have like games today. You can change input sensitivities to whatever you want them to be. We didn't have that. We were at the mercy of this stupid game when it came to that type thing. Yeah, I raised my eyebrows at you because I hate the Mario 64 camera. I hated it back then. I hate it now. It's yeah, I, I but I get what you're saying. The point being made that it was built a little better for that game. <laughs> yeah, for what it was. And I mean, you got to think that was like the first one of the first big adventures in a truly 3D space. So, I mean, yeah, there's growing pains and stuff like that. And maybe with this new, oh, I wonder if they changed that for the new Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Ooh, yeah. that's going to be interesting. But that's a conversation for a different time. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious about that, too. We'll have to talk offline for sure. So you said that, you know, you played through a lot of the campaign. When you were playing it, did you know about the little... I guess, secrets of if you beat ca- the campaign on a certain difficulty and, you know, at a certain speed, you would unlock cheats and stuff like that. Did you know about that? And did you aim for them when you played or were you kind of just like a leisurely stroll through James Bond's eyes? I was a kid. I, I It was just a leisurely stroll. I think once one of my friends got it, we ended up trying to get some of the cheat codes. But honestly, this was in the era of Game Shark. So, you know, any cheat code that was or wasn't supposed to be in a game, we had access to anyway. As an adult, I enjoy that grind. I love that kind of, all right, I want to unlock everything. You know, like in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, I want to get all the decks. Does it do anything? No, but I want to have every version of whatever is available if I want it or someone else wants to play. They can do whatever. But uh, back in the day, Hell, I couldn't be bothered, I don't think. Yeah, that's understandable. I was just curious. I know that whenever we played, most of the times, you know, my friends had put their time in and had some of the cheats. Whether they got that through Game Shark or not, I don't know. I almost called it Game Genie. That's how old I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was one. I do know that we had them and and I enjoyed some of them. Another way that I was able to get past my parents a little bit was um, putting on paintball mode. Well, oh, yeah, kind of helped a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those uh, god awful rainbow colored paint splatters. I'm like, look, they're not even using real bullets. So I had to I had to really finagle my way around it. And hopefully they'll never listen to this podcast, which they probably won't. But needless to say that when they went to bed for the night, I turned everything back the way it was meant to be played. You <laughs> see, I. Well, I would think like statutes of limitations are over now. You know, we're yeah, in our thirties. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, they can't they can't punish me for it anymore. But cool. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our game list here. I'm going to go ahead and let you start. I will preface and let you know that as much as I enjoyed the game, I don't think I enjoyed the soundtrack nearly as much. Maybe as you, I don't know. I, I Maybe I got a different vibe from your notes. I'm not sure how you felt, but why don't you go ahead and, and start us off. Tell me your number five and, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, yeah. It was actually really weird listening to this because I was kind of, I'm not going to say dreading, but what I remembered of the soundtrack from back in the day is not what I heard playing. Mm-hmm. And that is a compliment because I had the text to send you ready to go saying how much I hated this and how it's just all the same song. And a lot of it is, but there's enough variation. And I was pleasantly surprised at how much I actually enjoyed going through this. So having said that, my number five is honestly, it's so stupid. It is the elevator track. It is the elevator B. (laughs) And Peter, you can't give me too much crap for this one because you put punch out two episodes ago. And I feel like they're in a similar kind of funny vein. This is the dumbest track I have heard in a very long time. When it came on, I honestly, I laughed out loud. I had forgotten where this takes place or even when. When I was doing research, I watched a few gameplay videos to reference some of the tracks and found where this 
was on accident. This takes place at the very start of the 17th level known as caverns. James is in an enemy base going to some caverns via an elevator. James never goes to any caverns in the movie. Because of that, this level should not exist and neither should this track. Why is this music in the enemy base? It's just a different version of the James Bond theme. It doesn't make any sense at all and it's so stupid, but I found the whole thing so funny that it's my number five. I am almost insulted that you put this on here because you thought it was the equivalent of punch out from persona. Okay. <laughs> uh, fair, um, but I stand by it. I know I, I, I would never wrong you for your opinion at all ever, but it's just like one of those things, right? I listen to this track and you know, it's pretty short and very repetitive as it should be being an elevator song. But I was like, I don't really have a lot to contribute as far as the discussion goes. I didn't like it. It does fit what it's supposed to be. It really does nothing for me as a, as a song. The thing that was interesting is that I actually, while I was doing my notes for this, I was reading up about golden eye. Cause I wanted to know about the remake that they had done on the Wii and things like that. And just getting some overall history behind this game franchise. The thing that they talked about was that they did try and stay true to the movie for the most part, especially during like very key moments. But they did say that they wanted to add a little more to make it more of a game for people to play. They wanted people to keep coming back and wanting to keep playing and things like that. So there were quite a few areas that, didn't exist in the film that did end up making it onto the game. And I never really thought that anything was out of place. I remember the caverns actually quite well. I do remember this elevator part pretty well as well, but it's, yeah, it was just one of those things. I was like, man, he put this on his list and I'm really surprised. I, I thought at first you might've thrown it on there just because that, that person Robin put, all their time and effort into this one song and and ended up being mediocre at best. But I I joked and at the end of my notes, I put at least my punch out song had a little substance. (laughs) It does. It does. And I won't take anything away from it. But this is just it doesn't make sense. You know, the whole the more I thought about the story of it, how the level wasn't in the movie. And I think like the Aztec level also is reminiscent of something that's not in the movie as well. But there's just something about the story. And the more I thought about it, the more I just started laughing. And that's the only reason why it's even on here was because it's just ridiculous that this track exists at all. Yeah, definitely is. All right, buddy, what you got? My number five is the dam. I adore this track. I played Goldeneye long before I actually watched the film. So a lot of the locations and scenes and things like that were very new to me. I didn't know any of the references. I didn't know how much they tied from the movies to the games and vice versa. And I didn't know the music was going to sound as good as it was going to sound. The dam is the very first stage and it opens up with one of the best sounding tracks, in my opinion, in the game. It's only five on my list due to preference. Uh, And by that, I mean my own personal music preference, not necessarily talent or uh, complexity. But it's just one of those things that it opens up really strong. And I, I agree with what you said about how it does use kind of the same theme and kind of redoes it over and over again. But 
having been a Final Fantasy fan for a long time, I'm, I'm used to that kind of thing. Uh, they usually take whatever the theme song is for a Final Fantasy game. They'll take that song and kind of like remix it a few ways throughout the soundtrack. Notably, 9 and 10 do it quite a bit. this on your list i do it's my number three i love this track this is 007 full stop this is an exciting and invigorating track that has notes of mystery and espionage that's all james bond is this is the music for the first level and i think it does a great job at setting the tone and the adventure or the tone of the adventure that you're about to set out on because it just really sets the tone and the pacing so well yeah, it really is a, a solid track. This is not the track I think of when I think of Goldeneye, when I play it or anything like that, but it's very close up there on my list for sure. As right, it rightfully sir. should be, yes. Yeah. So tell me about your number four. My number four is a track called Control. And this is kind of like Elevator Beat, but completely different because they're both very unique tracks, but this one's so much better. My first note on this is, hey, look, someone allowed Funky Kong to make a GoldenEye track. And that's really (laughs) what this sounds like. I really dug the hip hop beats that are scattered all throughout this track. I dig the electronic vibe of this track as well. Most of the campaign tracks, you know, like we said, follow the very similar structure So I felt like I had heard, quote unquote, this track a few times earlier, but it's really these elements that made it stand out as a much better track than a lot of the others. It's not super great by any means, but I appreciated what it was trying to do and put a definitely put a unique twist on a classic theme. this on my list as well but for me it fell under number two i guess i should probably forewarn this episode's probably going to be a little wonky uh we'll probably be jumping around numbers because of how our tracks fell but in an effort to keep things cohesive i didn't want to be like talking about yours and then coming back and talking about mine plus the tracks are so short I, i don't have a whole lot to like recycle and reuse so you would just be hearing it twice so it made sense for us to just kind of mush them together but like i said this this track fell under my number two slot and i i text cody right after i'd finished my notes because what i do is i write out my notes for it and then i look at his and kind of compare and contrast and see if there's anything i might have missed or something i want to talk about that he had spoken about but this track For him and I, we had the exact same notes, specifically around the Funky Kong bit. I I literally wrote down, how groovy is this track? And is it me or did you get some serious Funky Kong vibes? Absolutely. I talk about DKC actually a couple of times in my in my notes here, but I think it's because the teams that 
worked on this, I think at least there's a little bit of crossover from um, DKC. I don't know how big Rare was, but it sounds like just from hearing this track that it was probably a smaller group. It sounds like they tapped some instruments used from the SNES, and I'm thoroughly convinced of that. They may not have, but it, it certainly feels like it. It's probably evident in my picks across all, all of our episodes. The funky bass line is really what drove this one to be so high for my list. I am a sucker for a sick bass line that drives a track from beginning to end. That's why it ended up on, on my number two. Yeah, and this definitely has that. I had a feeling that this was going to be on your list because for the first time ever, I got my notes in before you, which hasn't happened. So I was interested to kind of see where it would rank on your list, but I had a feeling that it would. All right, buddy, tell me about what's next. My number four is Multiplayer 13. So they have a list of tracks on the soundtrack that are just listed multiplayer and then a number. And I actually don't remember there being that many songs to listen to. I mean, it had been a long time since I played multiplayer, so maybe they were tracks that never made it or something like that. But this one and 12 I had sat on for quite a while because I remember hearing them a lot as a kid. And I liked them both for their own reasons, but I ultimately settled on 13 just because it is more fast paced. It's got a lot of high energy and it gives me that feeling of kind of like, oh God, which friend is going to be behind this door when I open it, hanging out with Proximity Minds? And the answer is probably Cody. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But there is nothing that has felt more depressing in my life than missing a proximity mine because you know when they're set you could shoot them and disable them and get through a door if you needed to but nothing more depressing than missing one as you're trying to go through a door running through it and just watching your health bar deteriorate as that explosion goes off and you're just like man i cannot believe i missed that i felt like i would be remiss if i hadn't put a multiplayer track on it uh, on my list rather so this this is on my number four multiplayer tracks that I remember hearing. This is probably the only one I recognize, but I was doing some thinking as to the reasoning why, and I think I figured it out maybe for both of us, for all of these multiplayer tracks, it's kind of like we were talking about some of the later levels in like Donkey Kong or something we didn't hear as much because we didn't play that long. I think it's something similar to this because you weren't focused on the music. You were focused about yelling with your friends, you know, and that Mm -hmm. friend interaction. So that might be a reason why a lot of these tracks didn't hit for both of us. Yeah, you're probably right. It was definitely loud when we played, unless it was late night or something and our parents were sleeping. We were always pretty rowdy when we played this. It really spoke volumes for how good the multiplayer was that you could sit there and be arguing and and talking about this game and still walk away and be like that was great i can't wait until the next time we do it (laughs) yeah i remember god there was this one hmm, i'll call him a jerk because i didn't like him as a kid he was convinced that we had an invisible game shark because of how good we are at the game that's a memory that I will always remember because his mom had to come over and tell us to go easy on him or be nice is what she actually said. But that's a memory I have associated with multiplayer that I can't stand because that I don't like that kid still. We're going to start keeping tallies, I think, of the names of your friends. So we have Moron and Jerk so far. I'm uh, curious. Jerk, this is Jerk's one off. OK, Moron will return. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. All right, man. Tell me about number three. 
So my number three is Severnaya Bunker. This area was interesting because it's by far the most open area that you're in when you start off anyways. But if you remember from the Donkey Kong Country episode, uh, I enjoyed a lot of the tracks on there that sounded kind of on brand with the PT-16. And this song to me was no different. I loved how the percussion, the little ratchet noise, and then the triangle give off like this vibe of a, a clock ticking as if you're like running out of time. What makes that so special is if you did the missions on a certain difficulty under a certain time, it would unlock some kind of cheat. I really adored those challenges more so as I got older than as a kid. But even as a kid, I knew about them and and knew they existed. So I enjoyed trying to get them, even though I was terrible at it. And I thought this really fit the the bill for that. Something I did want to note is that about halfway through the song, this and, and quite a few others on this soundtrack changed the style quite heavily. And they become even better than they were from the start. So this is one of those ones that starts off pretty low key and chill. There's really just the percussion piece into it. And then of course the melody, but then it like switches midway through and becomes like adds in the bass and everything sounds pretty heavy the whole way through. notice that as as you went through no but now that you mention it yeah like it's easy to see it um honestly like looking back there's two that have the same what is it severna however uh severnaya severnaya thank you there are two tracks that start with severnaya and i keep getting the two confused between bunker and i forget what the other one is um so i actually had to go back and re-listen to this and you're right there is a change i just didn't notice it until you pointed it out yeah it's pretty cool to hear it's one of those things too where it's like i don't know if it's because it's been so long since i played the game but i don't remember these switches i just remember the beginning parts really really heavily and then uh, as i re-listened through the soundtrack to to write up my notes for this for this episode it was like wow that was pretty cool i really enjoyed that and it's now even more solidly in whatever place that it ended up being. It was pretty cool. Yeah, honestly, I don't even remember the level that well. Do you? A little bit. So like I said, I'm pretty sure it starts off, you're out in like a big open snowy field and you're going around. There's a few guys kind of riddled out in in the field or whatever. Oh. But your goal is to get into that bunker, uh, if I remember correctly. The bunker with the big satellite dish. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Now now I know this track really well. Okay, because that was like level... God, it was one of the earlier levels, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. Most of mine fell into the earlier pockets. Like I said, we don't really go by all personal opinions. So some of the songs we've heard before, we've never experienced. But I, I noticed that in this game in particular, it seems like all of the good tracks were really in the beginning. And not to say that the other ones were bad per se. It's just just sounded better in the, in the start of the game, I think. Yeah, and some of that's nostalgia. Probably um, we've been disappointed by nostalgia looking at you, Tony Hawk. But <laughs> yeah, I think you're right on the money for this. Let's see. We went through your number three, which was damn. So let's go ahead and hit your number two. My number two, I don't have a whole lot of notes for. It's Runway X. My question is, why wasn't this the actual music for the runway level? Because it is so good. This is a track that is really hard to describe because of how short it is. It's less than a minute, but it is just this vast improvement over the original track. I don't know why it's not there or where would you have heard this if it wasn't on the level? Do you have any insight into that? No, actually, I was trying to dig around and see where it was, but I couldn't find it. And I don't know that I played. I imagine that it was later in the game because of where it fell on our on the soundtrack. So right. I was trying to find any kind of gameplay there, but I know I didn't play through the campaign far enough to find this. So I don't know if it's like a revisit or something like that. Or again, it's hard to tell. It could have been even like a track that they had made, but never actually used it. Yeah, it's really hard to say. Yeah, Nintendo did some weird stuff like that where I could clearly see this, you know, not even being in the game and just on the soundtrack. But they did this for, I want to say, three or four levels. And every one of them, I like the X version better. It's just that Runway X is hands down my favorite of all of them. Listen to this track. I can't say that I liked it any more or less than Runway. Really? Uh, yeah, it just, it didn't really. So I, I mean, I don't care for either song regardless, but it just didn't do anything more for me that would have made it stand out as a, being a better version of it. But what I did like about it was that it, it seemed to have used the same general theme or melody that kind of carried it along, but just different notes. So if you stick the two side by side, you can definitely hear how the two kind of sound like one another, but they do play very differently. It was a really cool way to arrange it so that you knew where you were, but at a different time and place. I mean, I'm guessing that's what they were aiming for. Let's assume, but yeah, like runway, the original is a lot slower paced than runway x that's one of the main takeaways and why i prefer it more personally and i understand the exact reasons why you don't like it or one of them and that's totally cool and that's okay but for me you know in my style of music that's why i was surprised to have liked this soundtrack as much as i did when going into it i expected it to be nothing all right sir tell me your number one it is the main title now two things first off i admit that i have a huge thing for main themes in general i love them and this is the freaking james bond theme i mean come on that's literally my only note like all you have to do is say james bond theme music and that's what this is it starts out a little bit differently because it actually when you boot up the game it does like the spinning rare and the spinning nintendo logos and then all of a sudden it just hits with that dan it dan it dan it and just goes right into it 
And that's all I needed. I was sold from that point forward that this was going to be fun. Even just like we said, going over to a friend's house, you put up in the cart, you hear the music, you know that what's about to go down and that you're about to have a blast or hate your friends, depending on how good slash bad you are at this game. But no, I just really, truly enjoy this track. I love, you know, main themes. And like I said, it doesn't get too much better than Bond for me. song for the first time playing this game yeah you know, i didn't realize how impactful that was having this this track on there and i remember thinking the same thing you know you boot up the game those two logos come on and there's this like almost like a heartbeat sound right before this theme yep, comes yep. on but getting to see all of that you know the little scopes kind of come out and bond walk out and then look at you and shoot and it kind of turn red like all of that stuff i never realized how iconic it was until i finally went back and watched the movies and i'm like oh oh i got it now this is this is why they put this in here you putting this on your list i mean this is a this is a fail safe pick for sure i don't know anybody else who would listen to this and be like no that that doesn't belong here Aside from being a rearranged version of the movie theme in like a video game format, this is 100% James Bond. I, I agree thoroughly with that statement. It's iconic, and I feel like they would have some very angry fans had they not put something like this. Like if they had just said, okay, we're making a James Bond game, but the title theme is going to be something else, you know, something original that we're going to write. I feel like that just never would have never would have jived with anybody. MGM would have would have had a fit. Fans of the series would have had a fit. That's yeah, would roll just, if they did that. Yeah, yeah. So I can totally see why this is on your list and why it made number one. It's interesting because you brought up the character model walking in and then turning and looking at you. I do want to say we assume he's looking at you because the character models in this game are garbage. I mean, Minecraft looked better <laughs> than these guys. Yeah, the texturing on the faces were pretty bad. But, you know, they had some pretty revolutionary things, too. The feature of being able to shoot somebody in a specific part of their body and them react to that shot is mm -hmm. I'm fairly certain that was brand new at the time. Nobody else had ever done anything like that. So I think I can forgive the terrible m mashup of color splotches that were supposed to make a face. <laughs> for features like that. I thought that was pretty neat. All right, fair enough. All right, man, tell me what is your number one? My number one is facility. I am laughing because I pulled up my notes and it says type here at the top. I, I noticed <laughs> that and almost changed it, but didn't. I don't, yeah, I don't know why it says that. That's really funny. But what I was saying on this was that I'm I'm not really sure why this track in particular, but whenever I think of GoldenEye, the game, not the movie, facility is the first thing that comes to my mind. The level, the music, you know, what you have to do in that mission and everything like that. Having gone back and watched the film and then played the game even more beyond that, the scene with Trevelyan and Bond in the gas chamber is just as iconic as the title theme. And I, again, one of those things where as a kid, I didn't appreciate how much time and thought went into recreating that as, as I do now, but the conversation is iconic. And this song gives such strong, like heartbeat vibes with the, 
bass that just really amp you up to feeling that this is the pinnacle moment for James. It's really like one of those things where this sets the stage for what's what's going on. You don't realize it yet until you get a little further into the game as to why, but it really does. It ends up being that moment where, you know, James is is kind of driven partly by what what happens in this this stage. So I'm wondering that if that's why if that's why that happened. But I tweeted this out off the Deep Base podcast Twitter account and I said that half of everything is luck, Cody. Do you know the answer to the other part of that? Quote no, by any chance? I don't. And I'm kicking myself because I almost rewatched this movie for this too. Yeah, no, it's okay. I just put it there because I do enjoy it quite a bit. And I also want to shout out Sean Bean for playing Trevelyan in the movie long before I even knew who he was. I He actually played in quite a bit of things that I didn't know before I started recognizing him in Game of Thrones. <laughs> Sorry, I Sean, just... but I, I know you now. <laughs> First off, this track is amazing. And you're right, when I think about this game, this is actually the track that I think about. What's interesting about that, though, is going into this, this is the track where I was like, oh, this might not be good. Not because the track isn't good, but I was expecting every track to kind of be similar, not the same. But I was like, if we get a soundtrack that's all of that, you know, this one track that I remember, I'm going to be really upset. And thankfully, we didn't. We had a great little soundtrack here. Going off the Sean Bean thing, I just want to know, has he lived through a project yet that he's done any of them at all? Yeah, you're talking about the character that he played. Did it? Did the character live? Yeah, where he, the character, lived throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I believe he lives in National Treasure. He plays the antagonist in that film and spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't watched national treasure but he only gets arrested in that no man this is a really good track this is you know like i said this is the one i think about more than you know my number one more than main title this track is synonymous with goldeneye 007 yeah they do a really good job mixing up the theme and peppering it into these tracks without being overbearing. And not a single one of these feels out of place. I may not like them all, and I may think that they're just okay across the board, but you never hear one and you're like, oh, that doesn't fit the locale, or oh, that doesn't fit what I'm doing here, or anything like that. It's just, they all jive really well with what's going on in the game at that given time. So that that was something I really enjoyed, but facility by far for me takes the cake and understandably so no i completely get it and yeah you're absolutely right man all right man check another one off the list we have gone through our top songs i know that was kind of a little different than what we normally do because of the matching songs but in different locations but hopefully when i take a stab at putting this all together everything sounds cohesive enough for you guys Uh, Like I said, I didn't want it to be too all over the place as far as like hearing a song and then hearing it again later and it be the exact same experience. No, I think it's fun that we actually had a conversation more just about the tracks in general. I mean, yeah, we rank them and everything, but I mean, people who know us know what we do here and hopefully you guys enjoyed your ride with us. Yeah, definitely. Any final thoughts or anything you wanted to add into the the Goldeneye episode itself? 
Yeah, uh, actually, Peter, I have a correction. I'm going to correct myself. Last episode, I said that Chadwick Bozeman video I referenced was on Jimmy Kimmel. It was actually Jimmy Fallon, and I misspoke. Typically, I wouldn't go back and correct myself. I'm wrong all the time on this show. But with something that important, I just wanted to bring it up, correct myself in case people actually had trouble finding it. But I doubt anybody did if they actually went and looked for it. I searched for that video for like a week and a half and couldn't find it. And it's all because you butchered the, the host that actually did the interview. I hate you, Thanks Peter. a lot, Cody. <laughs> I hate you so much. No, I, I appreciate that. I actually haven't gotten to watch it yet, but I'm, I'm planning on it soon. I didn't have any additional thoughts as far as golden eye goes. You know, I think everything's pretty self-contained. It's, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like the game has aged poorly. If you go back and play it on the N64, you're going to have a hard time. But one thing I did do for this episode that I was, I don't, I don't want to say it's for this episode. It was more for my own curiosity, really. But I did pick up a playthrough of the GoldenEye remastered version on the Wii. But mm-hmm. they, they did it on the Wii initially for a year. And then the ex- exclusivity rights went away. And it got remade again on the PS3 and Xbox called... GoldenEye 007 Reloaded. And I watched a playthrough of it because I was morbidly curious to see, did they stay in line with the old game? How much did they deviate? And, you know, most of all, is this one more playable than GoldenEye is? Because I don't know about you, man, but when I go back to like old games right in the N64 PS1 Dreamcast era, when I play them now, I get nauseous. Nauseous as can be. I've never gotten sick feeling when I play video games. I would play for hours on end as a kid and nothing would change. Now, I don't know if it's frame rate or what it is, but something about those old games, just like it destroys my stomach. I can confirm that the while they did change a little bit to. I've never played it, but it seems like they did it to make it feel more cohesive and play a little better add a little more depth to the missions, that kind of thing. It does seem like GoldenEye 007 remastered or reloaded, whichever one you end up picking up, is still a good, solid first-person shooter to pick up. And I would recommend it. I still think you should play the N64 version just for the sake of games. But if you're looking for a game that you would want to actually go through, I would say try and scoop up a copy of that if you can find it. What do you say go back and play the original because of games and I was thinking to myself go back and try because if you haven't played that game before like we said with the C buttons it is so hard to play I doubt people a lot of people these days would be able to get through two levels of that like going back having not grown up with it the way you and I have you and I we could probably get it but some of the younger generation I don't know man To be fair, though, I don't remember in the campaign where you had to move your aim that much. I feel like that was multiplayer specific. Well, no, it's not so much moving the aim, but also just like navigating using buttons instead of a stick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hands down. I mean, strafing was on your left C and right C. And even that could have been there's no sensitivity. Like you said, it's just on or off. That can be pretty tough to to handle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Something I wanted to know about, you said going back and playing older games like that makes you sick. That is interesting. And to answer your question, that has happened to me, but Mm -hmm. only, and this is weird, only with Activision, not older games, but like motion sickness in general in games. It was on the PlayStation 2. I couldn't play Call of Duty 3 or Tony Hawk's Underground 2 because of the frame rates. I would just get so sick to my stomach that I couldn't play the game. I'd be very curious to see if there's some sort of science behind why that is. You know, are we so used to seeing games played smoothly in 30 or 60 frames that these older games with like their choppier frame rates or what have you, it's just not as comfortable to watch or, or what, but yeah. And it's just that era. I can play, you know, 2d games on the SNES or, I mean, even Star Fox, right. I could play that on the SNES and 
not have any issues. And then anything after that, PS2 to PS4, I'm all fine with. But yeah, PS1 era, N64 era, whatever that generation of console is, can't do it. It just, it makes me super nauseous. Oh, that makes me sad because there's some classic games on those too. That's really unfortunate. I'm sorry, but I know, I know. Well, I'm going to try and muscle through. Maybe I'll take some Dramamine before I, I play him or something. I don't know. <laughs> You're going to be so coked out of your mind. Just <laughs> <drooling. laughs> that's all right. I'll, at least my backlog will be cleared, but good. No, I, that's something that's never happening. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I do have a question. I, sorry. I know I kind of sprung it on you here because I forgot to write it in when I thought of it, but I feel like you probably, I know, I know I'm like you said in like episode one, we're professionals here, (laughs) Um, but I feel like you probably do have an answer for it anyways. But my question for you and then for anybody who's listening and wants to respond Make sure you guys tweet us at Deep Base Podcast for for anything you want to talk with us about. And, you know, we'll, we'll throw in a few answers here and there. But what was your favorite weapon to use when you were playing Goldeneye? Ooh, proximity mines. Period. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like you probably have an answer and it was going to be proximity, especially hearing your story about them. But yeah, you were the people I love to hate, man. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. God, well, there was a multiplayer level that kind of had like a tower in it that overlooked like this weird bridge area. I forget the name of it, but I remember all the walls being completely gray and those hid those yeah. damn things so perfectly. And that's where I would go. I would just go sit in that tower and I could go pretty much throughout the entire map and know which mines I was or was being detonated, obviously, because I was looking at my friend's screen. You know, we were all cheating off each other hardcore but yeah then just run all the way back you know shoot the ones i knew where they were go throw another one up and then barricade myself back into that little tower area yeah i remember that level actually quite distinctly there was like rafters and stuff you ran through and things like that there was it's funny how much of that i remembered proximity mines were the bane of my existence you know we would get pretty creative with where we threw them sometimes we wouldn't even put them on walls we'd actually if you remember the doors they typically slid open like you were inside of a temple it didn't matter where you were they all slid open but we we would slide the door open throw a proximity mine up onto the bottom of the door and then close the door again because the trip didn't get set for like a couple of seconds after you threw it so Uh, It was enough time to throw the mine on there and then close the door again. And you didn't know it was there until you got close enough to open the door and you blew yourself up. Yeah. And again, it's just because I was so bad at shooters. There was a time I was bad at shooters. Some say I still am. But yeah, that's the only way I was able to have fun in multiplayer was with those mines. And yeah, the ceiling and also the floor, if you have like a bunch of gunshots just in the area, you can kind of disguise it a little bit. But those uh, bullet holes only lasted for a couple of seconds anyway, so it didn't work too well. But if people are just running around a corner, boom, if it's on the ground, you're done. My favorite weapon was the slappers. Moonraker laser. Yeah, I know it should have been slappers. <laughs> no, it was the Moonraker laser. I'm, I'm one of those people that doesn't like to worry about ammunition and the Moonraker laser was always infinite ammo. So it was fun in that regard, but it was also a really cool weapon that kind of stood out, right? All these guns were very traditional guns that you're used to seeing. And this wasn't, this didn't really fit the bill. This is like, hey, we decided to throw up a little bit of Star Wars in the middle of James Bond. You've got these Moonraker guys dressed in yellow hazmat suits and they drop these lasers that are pretty wild looking. I mean, it's a really bizarre looking gun. If you get a chance, either yourself or anybody else who doesn't know what they look like, Google them because they're very weird. Yeah, I enjoyed the Moonraker laser quite a bit. I actually just did that because I don't remember this gun. No. No, I don't. Like, I wish I did. But, I mean, looking at it, it looks familiar, but I never remembered using it. Yeah, so one of the things that they did was they did loop in a little bit uh, from some other bonds into this game. And Moonraker was one of those games. So 
we ended up with Moonraker people. There was like a male and a female character model that you can be in multiplayer and they had the Moonraker gun. So there were a few other ones I liked, but most of the reasons I liked them was because of how fun they felt when you had a rumble pack insert, which mm. I'm surprised we never actually talked about, but yeah, the rumble pack was key in this game. Absolutely key. It does add a lot. And it's so weird to think where our controllers are now, where we're talking about haptic feedback, you know, it's like, Jesus, what, a, like, what, like it all, you know, in a way started back then the sense of, something real you know and even if it was as basic as what the rumble pack was it was a starting point so it's really kind of interesting to honestly be that old and remember it nintendo always did some really bizarre stuff and i feel like they were the innovators for a lot of technology and the rumble pack was really one of those things the dual shock hadn't been invented yet mm-hmm. it might have been on the cusp because it, i don't think it took them Uh, sony too long to get it but uh for those who have never owned an n64 or really don't know older games but the rumble feature was something that was revolutionary at the time and for the n64 you had to put this giant two double a powered packs into the back of your controller uh, which added what a good two pounds onto the end oh god that thing was so heavy it was, but it was how you got any kind of rumble feedback. And they they supported it through a lot of games, but GoldenEye was definitely one of the ones where it felt the best. The, the rumbling, it's not like they had a whole bunch of motors or anything, so you didn't have like light rumbling or heavy rumbling. It was this the same rumble the whole time, but it was how they rumbled it that made it different. So the AK-47 or the Soviet, I think is what they called it in... Goldeneye would shoot and it was just this long standing, you know, dot, 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 dot. And then there are some that shot faster or slower. Yeah, it was just, it was really well implemented. I don't know if I played it with the rumble pack that often. I don't think I did because I mean, it was just like another hassle. Good luck getting enough friends and controllers around just to play. So I don't ever think I actually played it with my rumble pack yet, believe it or not. Do you have a rumble pack now? Oh, I've always had one. I just don't think I had it attached because, you know, you could take it out and put it back in. Yeah, I got it when I got my 64 because my 64, the game I got for it was Star Fox. And that's where you got it, you know, back in the day. That's right. Um, That's right. I had it. Yeah. But I mean, I can see myself like, again, because I didn't own the game and I went on vacation, I can see myself leaving the rumble pack at home and then just never being at a friend's house with my rumble pack to play it. So it was probably some complication of things, but yeah, I, I never got around to that. That's odd. Well, I suggest in the near future, you change that. Cause it is a, it is a night and day experience. I feel like you definitely feel a little more ingrained in the game, playing it with it. Oh, no doubt. I mean, just with the other games that do support the Rumble Pack, they all add something, you know, whether it's a hidden item in Orc Arena of Time or your boosts in your bombs in Star Fox. You know, it nothing about that little heavy freaking thing detracts from any of the games they really paired it with. Well, I think we've we've about done it with GoldenEye 007. We're going to go ahead and and wrap it up here. Cody, as always, thank you so much for uh, sitting alongside of me and going through these, no matter how painful they are. (laughs) Actually, it was this one isn't too bad. No, I really Uh, enjoyed my time with this in particular. Yeah, yeah. It made me want to go back and play, which I think is is really the the key here. And uh, I, I did enjoy it, too. So but I appreciate it, as always, for your input and insights. Yeah, no problem, man. I can't wait to see you again. Yeah, for sure. Um, Thanks to everybody else who's been listening and everybody who has um, subscribed, uh, whatever platform you are listening on. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody for uh, really just supporting us through this. It's been it's been quite fun. We will see you next time for episode eight. Thanks for listening. Bye.